Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, as more people are coming in, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started tonight. So um, uh, it's been a long semester, <laughs> and uh, this is the last. Um, this is the last talk on the lecture series, uh, Sound Studies, and so I welcome you all here. Uh, we have a special event tonight. We're coming to you from uh, Treaty Six Territory, uh, which is a traditional gathering place for Indigenous people. Uh, including um, the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Diné, Ojibwe, Inuit, and many others um, who have lived here over the ages. Uh, SSI uh, Sound Studies is committed to ensuring that those histories and languages and cultures continue to influence the vibrant community. And I just want to say a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, for those who might be attending for the first time, uh, Sound Studies is a research institute uh, here at the University of Alberta that celebrates and promotes a variety of research projects that have to do with sound um, from the university community, um, as well as from, from outside the university community. Um, and we're really happy that you're joining us this evening for this talk. Um, and I want to also just give a special thanks to Oliver Rossier, Tom Merkinger, and Gail Mandrick, who um, have been uh, wonderful in helping me steer this interesting ship, um, which uh, begins with um, a very, very special collection of records that we're celebrating this evening. Um, so this, this record collection, first of all, let me just um, quickly introduce um, Julia Bile, Dr. Julia Bile, who's here. She's gonna be joining us um, a little later. She and I are sharing this evening. Uh, Dr. Bile is the um, interim director of um, the Center for Ethnomusicology, and of course, I'm Scott Smallwood, the director of Sound Studies. And together, um, Julie and I have a love for listening to records, so this was really, really fun and easy to put together. <laughs> um, and uh, what we thought we would do tonight um, to share, and I'm not going to, I have a big statement about the Moses Ash collection, Moses and Francis Ash, Ash, Ash collection. But I'm not going to read that because you can read that on our website. Um, I'm going to instead let the music speak um, about the importance of this collection tonight. Um, and what Julia and I have done is we've gone through the collection, the collection which um, is an in complete Smithsonian Records collection up to 1985. Um, and uh, we went through the collection and just picked three of our favorite selections to discuss tonight. Um, uh, or maybe favorite in the moment, because I have a lot of, of Gwes records that I love. And so that's what we're going to do um, as a way of celebrating um, uh, today's, uh, the birthday of Moses Ash. He would have, I think, 115 today. So, um, and Moses Ash brought to the world a collection of music that otherwise would not have been heard. Um, and this music um, spans more than just what we normally think of as folk music. Um, Moses Ash had a very expansive idea about what folk music is and all about. Um, and for him, um, it included everything from what we think of as folk music to music from around the world to recordings of um, the office <laughs> and other kinds of sound recordings, um, spoken word and poetry. Um, all kinds of things, um, a very, very um, uh, eclectic and important collection. Um, and uh, to start off tonight, <clears throat> first of all, just give you a little bit of an outline of what you're going to be hearing. <clears throat> Each of us are going to take about roughly 25 to 30 minutes uh, to talk about our three favorite, favorite selections and play you some excerpts. And then uh, we may go a slightly over time this evening. We're going to aim for being... Uh, finish with our presentations by around 8, 8.05, something like that. Um, and so those of you who may need to come and go, that's totally fine because this is going to be sort of a modular talk anyway. Um, but we will leave some time uh, in the end for questions, um, for those who can stay after 8, and we're happy to do that. Um, but first, I have a very, very important um, message from our sponsors, um, uh, or I should say, from a lot of people who are very enthusiastic about us doing this event and have sent us um, some greetings um, and birthday wishes for uh, Moses Action. So I'm gonna play that for you next.
Hello, my name is Bill Flanagan and I'm the president of the University of Alberta. The ash donation of the Folkways collection to the University of Alberta was a generous and welcomed gift. Moses Ash founded Folkway Records to document the people's music, not only through song, but also sound and language. The collection of the people's music found an ideal home here at the University of Alberta, where our commitment to advancing the public good fits perfectly with sharing and preserving the legacy of Mr. Ash and Folkway recordings. On behalf of the university, it is a great pleasure to send birthday greetings to honor Moses Ash. Thank you. I am pleased today to be able to pay tribute to Moses Ash and bring special birthday greetings. My name is Joan Greer and I am a professor in art and design at the University of Alberta and past interim director of Folkways Alive. I've been formally associated with Folkways music and cover art since I co-curated together with Margaret Ash, the exhibition, Seeing the World of Sound, the cover art of Folkways Records in 2005. But in fact, like for so many people, my first encounters with the pervasive and well-loved Folkways catalog of recordings long preceded this point. Moses Ash did not shy away from recording a diversity of socially relevant, highly topical, and often politically radical works. As he stated, and I quote, with the formation of Folkways Records, I started the more intense catalog of protest songs, workers' songs, protest poetry, and documentation. When he founded Folkways Records in 1948, Moses Ash set out to document people's music, spoken word, instruction, and sounds from around the world, recording all, so all sounds of all peoples, preserving it and making it available to all and for all times. This commitment to preserving a living cultural heritage and to privileging cultural diversity, education, and community engagement has never been more important. What strikes me today is that more than ever, the legacy we have from Moses Ash rings true. Happy birthday, Moses Ash. Hi, I'm Steve Patton. As Interim Dean of the Faculty of Arts, I'm pleased to join the Sound Studies Institute to wish Moses Ash a happy birthday on what would have been his 115th birthday. Happy birthday, Moses Ash, and thank you for your legacy. Hi, I'm Arianne smith Piquet, and I am the Library Technician at CKUA Radio. I'm wishing Moses Ash a happy 115th I'm so thankful for Folkways and their contributions to folk music and capturing the sounds of life and communities throughout the world. Those field recordings have preserved the voices and culture that might have otherwise been lost or forgotten. By sharing the music and sounds recorded from the sounds of the modern office to the sounds of exotic animals, the Folkways collection brought the world home in a cardboard sleeve. Happy birthday, Moses. Hello, I'm Bill Worthman. Hi, I'm Betty Jo Worthman. On behalf of the Northern Lights Folk Club, we'd like to wish a big happy, happy birthday, birthday to Moses Ash. My name is Grant Stovall and a very happy Moses Ash day to one and all. I've been feeling the uh, unseen presence of Moses Ash and Folkways records in my life ever since I can remember. There were lead belly records in my house when I grew up and that shaped my life profoundly. I went on to kind of a life in music, playing music. I now have the great pleasure of being a DJ on the radio for a living. None of these things I suspect would have been possible without growing up on that great music in my household. And going on to, I mean, at CJSR, where I continue to volunteer, have done since I was a teenager, got very close to the connection, the profound connection between the University of Alberta and Folkways Records. And as a matter of fact, as a kind of totem for how much this has touched my life, I even went to school with an Ash. I went to school with Jessica Ash and came to know that her dad was a pretty big deal. And so was her granddad. And getting a chance to explore that through Michael Ash's great work on CKUA with that amazing Sounds to Grow On documentary series, just a phenomenal radio show slash podcast if you get a chance to check it out. I mean, the breadth and the scope is so wide. Each and every day, if I stop for a moment, I realize that I'm about to spin on the radio, whether it's on CKUA or on CJSR, something by 
Elizabeth Cotton or Sonny Brownie and Terry McGee or Odetta or Lead Valley, for instance. And every day I am grateful for the presence in my life of this music and the amazing visionary that made it possible blows me away. And so uh, from the depths of my heart, I say thank you, Mo Ash, all the ashes and Folkways Records. And yes, once more, let's all lift our glass to the legacy and the work and the vision of Moses Ash and Folkways Records. Happy Moses Ash Day. Gathering in Washington Square, we listened to a pirated tape of the Pygmies of the Aturi Rainforest. Sitting by the fountain, we learned songs by Woody Guthrie and Leadbelly. We learned about something called peyote songs and wondered where we could get some. The Vietnam War was dictating our lives. I didn't want to accept the war, and Folkways showed me that I didn't have to, that there were many ways to live, that there was always another way to think, to create and connect. Oftentimes, the world misses the point. It overlooks or outright rejects things that are important, things of beauty. Folkways struck the question, if not me, then who? Who will keep these things alive? In turn, these things continue to keep me alive. I never met you, Mo, but your work shaped my work and your life changed my life. Happy birthday, Mo. Oki and hello from the traditional Blackfoot lands and the University of Lethbridge in Southern Alberta. I'm here to join you in celebrating the extraordinary life and contributions to music making of Moses Ash. Congratulations on this birthday celebration. Hi, I'm Ken Regan, former CEO at CKUA Radio Network. You know, because of Moses Ash and his record label, Folkways Records, the world's had the great pleasure to hear the music of Woody Guthrie, Lead Belly, Elizabeth Cotton, Pete Seeger, artists whose songs not only entertain us and brought us joy, but artists who shaped music and society for generations. Artists whose music had profound impact on everything from the anti-war movement to the civil rights movement. And in my opinion, Moses Ash's Folkways Records has been one of the most important, if not the most important, independent record label in the history of recorded music. And we have Mo Ash to thank for that. So to Moses Ash, I do say thank you and happy birthday. Greetings to all our friends in Alberta. I'm Dan Sheehy, director and curator of Smithsonian Folkways Recordings from 2000 to 2016 and sitting in for a while as interim director. It's my great pleasure and honor to wish Moses Ash a happy 115th birthday. Mo, just as you brought so much meaning to so much music through stuffing those album covers with liner notes, you brought so much meaning to the lives of so many of us around the world. Thank you, thank you, and have a great 115th birthday. Okay, um, thank you to everyone who sent greetings and thank you for um, to Tom for putting together that wonderful compilation. Um, um, I really just, I'm so grateful to everyone who, who sent us those greetings. Um, this has just been a really fun time to hear what everyone has to say about, about him. Um, so uh, I'm gonna jump right into my presentation. I have three really fun records to share with you tonight. Um, one of them is not the one that you see pictured here. I'm cheating a little bit and including um, a fourth record um, just because in preparing for this talk, um, I just made a discovery that I had not realized before um, that hit me in a very profound way. <laughs> so the music that you were hearing when you first came in um, as you were waiting for the event to begin sounded a little bit like an alien harp or something. Um, that was music by Henry Cowell from a record um, released on Folkways in 1952, 
one of the earliest recordings um, of experimental uh, sort of quote unquote classical music from the US, um, uh, particularly by Henry Cowell. And the reason that I wanted to play that at the beginning and just talk for a moment about it is that um, this recording had a very, very profound effect on my life. And actually, um, people who know me have heard me tell the story uh, of how my fourth grade music teacher, for some strange reason, brought this record in to share with us in music class. I remember it well. I remember this picture of him with his hands on the piano. I remember the liner notes um, explaining how he did what he did. She played this music and everyone in the class but me uh, put their hands over their ears and didn't understand what they were hearing. <laughs> Me, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I dreamed about it. I tried to explain it to my friends and my parents, and nobody really understood. But it planted a seed in me, I think, um, and I largely attribute the discovery of that um, of this recording and these pieces to one of the one of the major reasons why I decided to become a sound artist and musician and composer. Um, so uh, it just was a really wonderful discovery as I was poking through our collection to find my records and to see this um, while I was browsing and pull it out and just be completely transported. And I thought I had no memory that this was a, a Folkways record. So anyway, just a, a fun little um, uh, piece of my personal history and, and, and one of the many reasons why I value this label. I'm going to start with um, <clears throat> a record that you might not have expected. Um, this is a very, very important recording um, of uh, some electronic music that came out in 1967. And the thing that to know about this recording um, is that uh, back in the 1950s and 60s when um, electronic music was just beginning to become a thing, there were very, very few places in the world where a composer could go uh, and work with the new technologies that were emerging at that time, at least in an experimental way. <clears throat> there were certainly recording studios around at that point, um, but most of them were geared for recording um, quote unquote conventional music. And they had a really, you know, a workflow and they had, uh, they were expensive and couldn't really just go in and experiment. Um, so as a result of that, some of the first uh, places to do that emerged in Europe, and we often talk about the Musique Concrete movement in Paris and the Electronische Musik movement in Germany, and those two rival studios, which were all connected to TV and radio stations um, and which had little research budgets. And so those things were beginning. Um, meanwhile, in North America, um, where the uh, landscape of radio and other things was very different. Um, those kinds of facilities first began to emerge, of course, in universities. And I think the first one uh, was the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center, but the second one was the Electronic Music Studio at the University of Toronto. And uh, Folkways Records, of course, was on the scene, uh, found out about this and released um, a recording of pieces created in that studio. Um, and this, again, another connection to my, to my own personal development. Um, when I was in graduate school learning about experimental music, and this was unfortunately before the internet age, so the places where we went to find experimental music was either the library, in the hopes that there would be something there, or your local record store. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in the library. And there were two record labels that we, uh, we young composers who were interested in experimental music knew about. One was the Composer Recording International, I think it's International, uh, CRI Recordings. And the other was Folkways Records. And so it's just interesting to note that um, Folkways was, on the, the, was really on the vanguard of not only um, documenting um, folk music and world music from all over the world, but also experimental music and 20th century music. Um, and so this record was an early discovery for me. Um, and I'll just play a little, my little excerpt many of you probably heard. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Okay, so that was just a little beginning of the opening section of a very, very famous piece of electronic music called Dripsody by the composer and inventor, Canadian composer and inventor Hugh Lacane. Um, and I think um, it's fair to say that this may be one of the most famous uh, early electronic music pieces in the world. Um, many, many people who may have never heard of electronic music have probably heard this piece at one point or another. It illustrates not only Lacan's extremely meticulous ability to uh, splice tape and re-pitch sounds. Uh, every single sound in that piece comes from a single recording of a drop of water, as you could probably imagine. And today we don't we don't think of so much uh, of in terms of innovation when we hear something like that, but. Um, in, uh, in the early 1960s when this piece was created, that was a very, very new thing and uh, a, a very big deal. Um, and so this, this is a, um, the other thing it illustrates about Hugh Lacan is that in addition to being a composer and someone who was really interested in medium, he was also an inventor. And this is important because the thing to keep in mind about many of these early studios and you can do a search for um, the University of Toronto Studio or the Columbia Princeton Center or um, the, the centers in Paris and, and uh, Germany and elsewhere. And you'll see in the, the historical photographs that a lot of pieces of equipment that are being used look like big sort of scientific instruments. <laughs> and they really literally were that because, uh, again, there weren't any pieces of technology that were made specifically for musical experimentation. Um, and in fact, there were very many, not really even very many electronic musical instruments around yet at that time. Obviously, we had some synthesizers beginning to emerge in the 1960s, but it was a new era. And so there was a real need for someone to create specialized equipment that composers could use rather than resorting to having to use these large oscillators and other things that were just very cumbersome and not always... Um, not always uh, the best uh, for experimentation. So Hugh Lacane was someone who really uh, put a lot of effort into trying to solve that problem. And he made a number of really interesting inventions. You can see the two photographs on the left here are of him with a couple of his inventions. Um, and uh, the, the photo on the right um, is actually, um, uh, I don't remember the name of that composer, but that's actually a photograph of one of his pieces, one of his inventions that was um, uh, sent to Israel for um, the one of the the very first electronic musical instrument or studios in Israel, um, and so uh, just just to show the the bet, uh, um, and another really fun thing about this time was that um, the University of Toronto knew that they were sort of onto something here, so um, they really um, they started a program that we now would call something like an artist residency where they would bring in composers who had never worked with this kind of equipment before to learn how to do it and to make pieces. And this recording um, was one of the first ways that for them to get that work out there for the world to hear. So a really important recording for the history of Canadian electronic music. <laughs> So as you can imagine, um, during the 1950s and 60s, um, there weren't a lot of women composers working in this world. Um, 
Now, um, at the time that I discovered this recording, I had also discovered the music of Pauline Oliveros. Um, this is not Pauline Oliveros. This is Jean Eichelberger Ivy. But Pauline was someone who um, I was really interested in her work and also her writing about deep listening. And one of her early pieces and one of her tra early training, some of her early training was at the University of Toronto studio. And she made a number of compositions there um, that I was already aware of. And so when I found this recording and I saw that there were another woman um, who had uh, managed to go to the studio and work um, and create this piece called Pinball, which you just heard a piece of there, um, I was very, very interested to learn more about her and discovered that she taught at Peabody Conservatory and had been the founder of the Peabody Conservatory Compute Electronic and Computer Music Center. Um, and uh, so I, I found that really inspiring, and I had also happened to see a bullet on the bulletin board a picture of the studio at, the, at Peabody. I remember back in those days, again, no internet, so the way we students found out about graduate programs was brochures that were put on bulletin boards in music departments. And um, there she is in the right-hand corner there, opposing in front of the Moog synthesizer, which I got to use as a student at Peabody. So I actually applied to go to Peabody as a graduate student in computer music, um, specifically because I wanted to study with her and to learn uh, and to use that studio and to learn about um, her legacy. Um, now, unfortunately, when I arrived at Peabody, she was just retiring, so I only got to have a couple lessons with her, but I did... Uh, meet her and got to use the amazing studio that she was largely par partially responsible for creating. Um, so I just wanted to mention that this piece was also on this record and just a really important one for me personally and a fun discovery to make as a graduate student. All right, and now for my selection number two. Um, now these recordings are also very close to my heart. Um, uh, they represent us, uh, the first recording of Steel Bands. But more importantly, um, uh, the f I think maybe they are the first recordings of steel bands in New York and in the U.S. in general. Um, uh, this is important today because um, New York is probably now the most active place on the planet for steel band uh, culture other than uh, Port of Spain in Trinidad. Um, I've been able to attend many panoramic panorama steel band competitions in Brooklyn over the years. Uh, it's been a long time since I've gotten to go to one. Uh, they're amazing events. And again, this was largely due to the fact that these instruments were discovered, um, uh, were discovered by a lot of people, but among the many people who found them fascinating, of course, was Pete Seeger. And Pete Seeger traveled to Trinidad uh, in the late 19th and he met a composer um, and performer there by the name of Kim Loy Wong. Um, and uh, uh, the rest is history. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But first, let's listen to um, a recording from, this is from the record on the right, um, from the University Settlement Steel Band in New York on the Lower East Side. Um, uh, and this uh, directed by Kim Loy Wong. short, but um, that's a wonderful little tune off this record um, that uh, uh, 
um, I, I chose this tune for a really important reason. Um, so again, the thing about um, Mo Ash and, and these recordings, as was pointed out by a number of people in the birthday greetings, um, he, he and the label were not content to just release these records. They released these records with lots of information in them about what was going on. Um, and this is no exception. Um, so this instrument at the time uh, was obviously considered a, a brand new instrument. And I think Pete Seeger, um, who was just, you can see him there in the photograph on the left with his shirt off, uh, kind of bending down. Um, he was just completely captivated by these things. And he went to Trinidad and met Kim Loy along, made some recordings, and then more importantly, um, convinced them to make a few drums for him to take back to New York. Um, and to teach them how to make drums. And over the years, uh, he learned how to do that and created this really neat instruction manual that actually came with the record. Um, and, uh, and then eventually, Folkways Records brought Kim Loy Wong to New York um, in the, the early 60s to work with um, at-risk youth in New York City to create um, a new ensemble um, and teach, uh, um, teach it here. And, so as you may or may not know, the steel band is pretty big in the U.S. now, um, especially in the Midwest. Uh, there's a lot of steel bands in universities, but also in New York City and on the West Coast. Um, and I think that some of um, uh, his bringing him to the U.S. Uh, was one of the reasons why that happened. And so it's, it was a, just a really exciting time. Um, now, when this record came out, um, it included not only this booklet um, for how to make a steel drum, but it also included something really neat. Side A on the record contained um, these tunes, mostly like Calypso and other um, kind of traditional tunes. Um, but side B, what they decided to do was to actually put the, some of the same music on there, but isolate the instruments so that people could understand how the steel band worked and what all the various voices were in the instrument. Um, so I'm going to play that for you in just a moment, but first I want to just show you a couple of, well, of course, there's Kim Loy Wong himself, um, the photograph on the right from sometime in the 1950s in Trinidad. You can see there he's playing um, what we call the bass pan. Um, and then on the left side, there he is as an older person who is playing on more modern steel drums. But I have to tell you, even though they're nice and shiny and chromed up, underneath those steel drums are made exactly the same way that they were um, in the 1950s and 60s, I mean more refined, but still using 55 gallon oil drums, still cutting them off and burning them and, and making them by hand. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to learn um, steel drums myself and played them in college. I um, uh, got to meet Ellie Minette um, and see him tuning pans and it was just a really fascinating thing to watch and learn about. So here's the same tune we just heard. part isolated. Call it that particular voice is called the guitar. And then this bass pans. Where's the melody on top? It's the ping pong as they call it. And the tenor drum. rhythmic part they called the conga but was actually another steel drum that was like a percussion more like a percussion part So anyway, I just think that is such a neat thing and really opened up the possibility of understanding what was going on with this with these instruments. And then here's just a couple of little like random parts of the book on how to make steel drums. And it's a beautifully made book, uh, very much sort of handmade. 
with these very detailed diagrams about how to make and tune all of the different voices, what tools to use, exactly how to etch them and how to tune them. Uh, just a, a really fascinating um, uh, instruction manual. Now, obviously, steel, band, steel drums have evolved a lot since this time, uh, and they're made a, a bit differently. The pattern is a bit different. Um, the voices are different, but um, a lot of things about the way that they're made um, are, are pretty similar to the way they were back then. And so it's, it's just a really fun historical document. And really, I think one of the, it pretty much the first how-to document about how to make steel drums. Of course. Sorry, I'm going to go back to that. One of, the last thing I want to just talk about here is in addition to the two records in the booklet, there was also a 16 millimeter film um, called Music from Oil Drums. Um, and you can search for this um, and look for it. It's available um, on a couple different websites because obviously you can't buy the film anymore, but it's available to watch. It's very, it's, I think it's, the total film is about 15 minutes long. And I just want to play you this very short excerpt of um, Pete Seeger showing and explaining um, a little bit. Of, I think he's showing the, the, the cello drum in particular, first being fired here and then being... Uh, being tuned up. So this is just a real short video excerpt. Of course, a steel band also needs altos, tenors, and basses. And on the fire, you see a tenor pan being heated. It's called a guitar pan. The sections are much bigger because the notes are lower. It's made in essentially the same way, however, and here he is tuning it. very definite reason why the notes are in such an irregular order. It's to minimize the dissonance. He lowers the tone when he hammers on it from the top. Uh, they're making six pans for me to take back to... So... Um, just a really fun film to watch. I encourage everyone to just do a search and look it up and watch it. Um, it's, it's super fun. And it just the last thing I'll say about this, um, again, just something that's really important. I know that today um, we kind of, we can look back on this period of time and sort of the Western gaze um, and the colonial uh, reach of, of things were very, very different. When, when Pete Seeger first went to Trinidad, it was actually still a British colony. Um, but something important to understand is that this music um, initially grew, it really grew on the streets um, out of um, a, a, the sort of traditional practices of um, people who had been enslaved and then freed um, much earlier than in, in uh, the U.S. But, um, and so there were a lot of people here from, uh, from Africa and also East India who were, um, although not slaves any longer, were still very much in the poorer classes, and the music that they were making on the streets was considered to be a juvenile activity. And in fact, there were a lot of arrests made, and there, were, there was a lot of fighting. And at one point in 1937, the government of Trinidad outlawed um, the traditional tambu bamboo instruments that these instruments, that these musicians used as percussion instruments, the, basically these big, long pieces of bamboo that they would bang on the ground in, in parades um, during carnival and other times. Um, and they lost the ability to do that. And what happened was carnival suddenly didn't have any rhythm. And so what happened is these musicians literally went into the junkyards and pulled out things that they could bang on. Um, and eventually somebody discovered that if you bang on a, on a 55 gallon oil drum in a certain way, you could actually dent it and create pitches. And so they started experimenting and made things, and it literally was born on the streets. And one of the things that was important about people like Pete Seeger, and also people from the citizenry of Trinidad itself, um, beginning to essentially um, uh, celebrate this music. Um, and now, of course, the steel pan, um, and what Daddy and simply call pan, um, is a point of pride in, in the country and um, is known <clears throat> is known worldwide. And so um, we'll give some credit to Pete Seeger, but I think we can also give credit to some of the really amazing um, innovators like Elliot Minette and Kim Loy Wong and Roland Harrigan and many others uh, from Trinidad. 
And finally, um, <laughs> uh, a funny segue, right? Um, sounds from the junkyard. So um, although the steel band uh, steel drums are sometimes referred to as originating from the junkyard, uh, which is literally true, um, yet the music and the culture of Spond are truly beautiful and unique and, and uh, just also a real success story um, for the people of Trinidad. Um, and, and so um, despite that, um, Mo Ash was also interested in the sound of the junkyard in a literal way. <laughs> and so I had to pick this recording as a person who some of you know me, I'm a field recordist and I do a lot of work in my own practice with recorded sound um, and so I was fascinated to learn about these recordings um, that were made of just everyday sounds. So um, this recording called Sounds of the Junkyard, um, this was, um, a, and these are a series of recording, recordings made by Michael Siegel. Um, I don't know much about Michael Siegel. I tried to find some things out, but there's not a lot of information about him. Uh, the only thing I know is that he recorded the sounds on this record as well as um, sound on the record, the Folkways record, which is called The Sounds of the Office. So if you're able to read the text, we're looking at the part that starts at 850, the paper bailer. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see me now. Um, that's the, the last little bit of that I wanted to play. Um, I chose that recording just because of the funny description of every little part of it um, uh, that was happening. Uh, so these three recorders, um, just again, I do a job illustrating a real breadth of, uh, of music and sounds that um, this Ash um, and Smithsonian Records was putting out. And just to remind everyone, uh, one of the things in my own preparation today and um, reading out Mo Ash and um, watching some films and listening to some podcasts, and just a fascinating person. A number of people um, made the made the observation Mo Ash was a very stubborn man uh, in the sense that in, in a very good sense for us, um, in, in the sense that these recordings, all of them, every single one of them, even the sounds of the junkyard, um, he insisted that throughout his lifetime, all of these recordings would remain in print, um, no matter how well they sold, and certainly they didn't all sell well. <laughs> um, and that is, uh, that is true to this very day. Every single one of these recordings are still available, um, and uh, we have him to thank for that. 
So um, at this point, uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Um, I'm going to just turn this now over to Julia Baia, who has another wonderful collection of sound for us. Thank you, Scott. Hello, everyone. So I have three, um, have chosen three musical examples, and I've chosen them for a couple of reasons. One is because each of them kind of represents a different way that music made its way into the Ash collection. And another is um, from an ethnomusicologist position, which is what I am. Um, each of these, the songs that I have, um, kind of show different ways in which music can be engaged with and represented and different ways in which the wholeness of that particular musical piece um, is presented through these through these sources. Um, so I've picked three, but this is the one that I was not able to pick, but I loved it so much um, that I brought up the cover of the um, album anyway. Author Corliss Lamont sings for his family and friends a medley of favorite hit songs from American musicals. And this is literally what that is. He's at his piano singing his favorite songs. And th this quirkiness is something that I really adore about Folkways, about looking at the catalog um, as a whole, uh, as I'm looking at Mr. Corliss Lamont looking at me. Um, just the specificity and the serendipity of getting this one guy by his piano with his family and hearing what his repertoire was, that this too can be understood as music, right? So there's this egalitarian element as well, not just the sounds of the office, but the sounds of the junkyard, um, not just the sounds of, um, of uh, gigging performers such as Woody Guthrie, um, but also a random man by his random piano. So I have um, must admit that I cheated a bit on this because the reason that I found out about this uh, particular um, album was because I was listening to the podcast that you all should listen to, which um, it is hosted by Michael Ash, Moses Ash's son, who is, I think, in the audience right now, which is called, um, it, is, uh, it is called Sounds to Grow On, and it is his uh, curation of Folkways, and there are 26 wonderful episodes. It was hosted uh, by him and, and also produced by CKUA, so there's an Edmonton L Element to it as well. Um, so I would very much recommend that you go ahead and listen to this. Um, but the one song that just captured me from the very first episode um, of this is um, from this particular album called Nueva York. And it's um, an, a it is a audio documentary that is um, recorded by a name, man named Tony Schwartz. Um, Tony Schwartz is an interesting person in and of himself. He um, recorded a number of different records for Folkways. He also recorded, recorded um, uh, a, uh, an entire album of the uh, spontaneous um, words of taxi drivers, which I think is quite interesting on Columbia. And um, actually, I think he was responsible for the infamous LB, LBJ um, uh, Daisy commercial, if that tells you anything. Uh, anyway, so this is a tape documentary that he made by going into Puerto Rican communities um, at the height of the migration in the 19, the post-war migration in the 1950s. And I have three small, very short examples from this, um, culminating in the song that really caught my interest because of the beauty of the voice, and yet the fact that it was entirely unscripted, that the, the people who were singing it were not performers, but they were just kids who were doing an assignment in their classroom as they were singing. So um, let's see here. Uh, this is Tony Schwartz right here. And um, I'm going to uh, move out of this to, to actually have us listen to the actual song here. So um, we'll start um, by just kind of looking at the album. Um, I think, oh, let me, uh, let me actually, uh, sorry, um, share so that you can see this. Here we go. Um, this is the interface on Alexander Street, which is where University of Alberta people get this. And as you can see, a lot of this is about the process of assimilation of Puerto Rican children who are citizens by this point, but newly arrived children singing in America, singing America is a very good example of what, um, what, you, what is the process is for these kids newly arrived to New York. Um, and yet what I find is quite interesting about this album and the, um, and um, 
Tony, Sh Tony Schwartz and Mo Ash who published it, is that it is actually against the grain of patriotism in this situation. Um, now, if you know anything about Mo Ash or about folkways, you can imagine um, the truth, which is that this is coming from a very progressive, egalitarian um, impulse. Um, and so the idea of fealty to the United States, of patriotism, especially coming in this case right after uh, McCarthyism, which concluded in 1954, this album was produced in 1955, there was not an uh, automatic assumption of fealty. And so listen to the comment of the teacher. Um, I'm going to play this first and then we're going to go back to a couple of different songs. Let's just listen. Well, it was about my second or third day of teaching. It was in an art class. I asked them, the uh, kids, to draw whatever they wanted to draw. It would be a good idea if you drew what you were most familiar with, and some of you, if you want, you can draw, if you wish, the house if you live here in New York City. Others, perhaps you remember better the house you lived in in Puerto Rico. Are you all Puerto Ricans? Oh, this was 100% this was Puerto Rican class. All, very few of the kids spoke English, and so those that didn't understand, the kids that spoke English told them in Spanish. Well, uh, all I see drawn are flags of, well, one kid I came across, come, I came up to his desk, and when I came up to his desk, he took his paper and flipped it over. And I asked him to see it, and, and I, I don't remember it was a girl, but he turned it over. It was a picture of the Dominican Republic flag, and on it, this is my flag. And I told the kid, you know, don't be ashamed of this, et cetera, et cetera. At any rate, I'm leaning over talking to this kid, and behind me, there's uh, something of a little racket. And the kid is doing a little dance. And I, they were singing a little song, and I asked what song they were singing. And they started to laugh, and I didn't know what they were saying, until I would talk, you know, let them know that I was curious about the song they were singing. And then this kid told me that the song was, I wouldn't take 65 United States for one little Puerto Rico. <laughs> so uh, let me play the next song, which is also a song from the same classroom. Let's listen to it really, really briefly. El hijo de mi tía tiene un horrible to. El hijo de mi tía tiene un horrible to. El hijo de mi tía tiene un horrible to y se cura con aceite a camporao. El hijo de mi tía tiene una. El hijo de mi tía tiene una. El hijo de mi tía tiene una. Y se cura con aceite a camporao. El hijo de mi tía. El hijo de mi tía, el hijo de mi tía, un horrible tos y se cura con aceite al camfora. El hijo de mi, el hijo de mi. Okay, so what you can tell from this is that this is a, um, a, a, a funny song where you take a couple of words from the phrase off the end of the musical phrase. And so the musical phrase makes less and less sense the further and further you go. Now, if you um, have listened to this folkways collection or any American folk music collection, you probably would be singing um, uh, either John Brown's Body, Lays a Moldering in Its Grave, or the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Or if you know civil rights music, you might sing some of the adaptations of this song for, for civil rights um, reasons. The point is that this is a song that has uh, considerable history in the United States. Here it is being repurposed um, as a joke song here, and the sounds of it, the musical phrase um, has less and less sense and more and more fun as it continues. So I, I really like this, um, particularly because of the sounds of the laughter of the children. The third one, uh, a folk song, song called Juan uh, Charasgado, um, I'll play, and this is the one that caught my, my interest, because it's two children who are singing while they were drawing, doing the, um, the, the, um, uh, exercise that their teacher had recommended and they're just singing this and one of them has the most glorious voice so let's listen to this voy a cantarles un corrido muy mentado lo que ha pasado de la feria del amor la triste historia de un ranchero enamorado que fue borracho parrandero y jugador 
Duende llamaba y lo apodaban charasqueado. Pero era, era valiente y arescado en el amor. A las mujeres más bonitas se llevaba. Y en aquel campo no quedaba ni una flor. Un día domingo que le andaba emborrachando. A las cantinas le corrieron Navidad. Cuídate, Juan, que por ahí te andan buscando. Son muchos golpes, no te vayan a matar. For brevity, I'll stop right there, but I love it that you can hear that girl's beautiful voice. I mean, she clearly has, she clearly has it. And yet, uh, the element of folk for this record is that you also get to hear the girl whose voice is not quite as good and have the social connection that is brought forward in that. So the, the reason that I love this as well, um, Tony Schwartz, who uh, I assume comes from a Jewish emigre family, talks about um, uh, his own experience, um, his family's experience, and actually in the liner notes, he puts in a, um, a, a um, bit of description uh, from the Anti-Defamation League um, about, quote, the poor Puerto Rican who is in the vast majority occupies a position in New York City, which has been accepted by millions from other ethnic groups before him. So this understanding that the Anti-Defamation League, which of course it was originally founded to root out anti-Semitism, uh, is advocating, as are many progressives, for the success of people who are in their places. Um, I, I really like this for this reason. All right, the second example that I've chosen, and I will try not to take too much time, but I thought that we really did need to have an example of one of the custom made musical um, musical gems um, that uh, um, was, if not recorded in the um, Ash studio uh, in the time before Folkways came about, at least was inspired by that larger collaboration. So uh, let's get back into my keynote, shall we? Um, I'm talking specifically about the ash recordings and you can see from the names that that are listed on the left, all of the amazing um, musicians who are part of um, this, including Lead Belly, including um, uh, Woody Guthrie, uh, Cisco Huston, all of these people. Um, uh, John Jacob Niles uh, is another one. Uh, and uh, this is quite remarkable because a lot of these individuals um, came to the Ash Studios and um, found social community there and music making there. Um, and often it was not, you know, simply you play a song and you're done, but there was a larger social engagement and collaboration that took place between musicians so that you could have Lead Belly and Woody Guthrie playing the same song and that being facilitated um, by, by the Ash Studio. The piece that I picked from this is um, one that I fell in love with just because of the fiddle. And uh, Alberta is a fiddle rich place. So um, I'm going Going, uh, I'm going to play for you the Cowboy Waltz. My understanding is that this is actually an acetate record that Guthrie himself recorded when he was out gigging. If I'm incorrect, so hopefully somebody will let me know. But what's interesting is that um, Moash heard Woody play this um, in the studio, presumably. But what I like about it is that even though um, this was published in New York City, the way that the geography ex uh, expands and contrasts uh, contracts, you have all of this uh, geographical range that you can see on this one record. So um, in the liner notes, which I should say are scholarly resources in and of themselves, not just primary documents, but often also scholarly documents. Um, there is discussion of people from a particularly good caller from a, from a dance coming from Vermont or coming from the Catskills and coming to the studios to, um, to record their artistry. This is an example in which you can actually hear the gigging musician. So um, in this little snippet, you can see that it, 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 it invokes the tempo, the dancing in the Southwest. Woody playing the fiddle country style, holding it against his chest. For album notes, he described the routine of the dances he used to play for. An old time waltz number, then a two-step, a foxtrot, a square, another waltz, a round dance, and a ragtime, and another square. 
These are, these are what he calls ranch dance tunes, which I particularly love because, of course, the order is determined by the expertise of the dancers and the everyday listeners and the everyday amateur um, musicians out there in the country in Texas and Oklahoma. So I like to imagine them when I'm listening to this particular song. Um, let me find this for you. Um, I think it's a particularly beautiful um, piece. So here we have um, uh, Cowboy Waltz. Guthrie is not singing, he's playing the fiddle, which we don't always get to hear, but we should always hear when we have a chance. <laughs> I don't think there's uh, much that I need to say about that. I think we should let it speak for itself as so often um, the Folkways records do. Um, I thought that I would go to a final musical example that has always kind of puzzled me a bit. The presence of this vast um, corpus of world music, of what you could sometimes consider to be folk music of the world, and how this might fit in with our understanding of folk music that's shaped by um, North American traditions, right? So um, when you're talking about folk music in the United States and Canada, um, I think we probably under have a basic understanding of what we're talking about, music in the vernacular, music that is transmitted um, um, informally community spread, <laughs> um, and music that does not require um, a lot of infrastructure or um, technology in order to perform that can be carried on your back, um, that can be carried in your vo vocal cords, which do not need to be particularly trained. But when you talk about world music, um, which uh, through the uh, Ethnic Folkways Library uh, constitutes a, a large part of the Folkways archive, then suddenly it gets a bit more confusing. Um, because often what we think of as being traditional music is not folk music necessarily, but ritual music or uh, music of a particular family or music um, that is connected with a religious tradition or with, you know, it, this is not, or a classical tradition with a court tradition. There's just such a wide variety of um, ways to understand music that the word folk kind of falls apart uh, when you start to think in this way. And yet you can understand the impulse. So the impulse of course is an egalitarian impulse um, and uh, it's an impulse that's born in curiosity. I think we need to recognize that um, in addition to, in connection to, this is in connection to Scott's um, presentation, uh, in, in addition to being a sound engineer and um, a, a, um, a just a, a 
scientist of sound or a technologist of sound. Uh, Moses Ash studied in Germany. He went to refine his understanding of, of technology and record. But he was just engaged in the larger intellectual um, milieu of New York City. And to move further back, if we think of his father, um, Shalom uh, Ash, who he was uh, a Yiddish novelist and dramaturg. Um, and so this idea, and not only that, but a, a religious scholar, as is so often the case um, with, uh, with, Jewish, with Jewish families. Uh, and so there's this understanding that um, the currents that were um, all, moving all throughout New York City, especially when you think of places like Columbia University with the anthropology department, Franz Boas, Margaret Mead, um, as well as the New School for Social Research, which was understood to be the university in exile, where all of the these new, uh, all of these kind of um, people escaping from fascism in Europe, all of these people congregated, that this is also part of the story. And so that's why I wanted to bring up the most academic, the most wonky um, uh, piece uh, example um, this, this night for sure, which is the publication of the demonstration collection of Erich Mortz von Hornbostel and the Berlin Phonogram Archive. So if you are an ethnomusicologist, and there may be some of you out there, you'll know that this is an, an incredibly important um, archive of music that was recorded in around the turn of the century. Um, the, the song that I'm going to play from you is from 1906 on wax cylinders. And it was recorded by um, the person, von Hornbostel, who was understood as the, the kind of curious opener of the field of uh, ethnomusicology. Um, however, we should also understand that the way that he collected music was um, sometimes he went out in the field to do this. In this case, he went to um, the United States and recorded uh, indigenous music of the Pawnee. Um, this is on this demonstration collection, but more often he would ask for people to go out and uh, collect um, music, and these would be the missionaries or the colonial administrators who would do this work. And so um, when it came back to Hornbostel, he would put this into a larger framework in which Western classical music was not even in the same category of all of these musical, um, uh, the musical material coming from all over the world. And he would very much be connected with the school of thought of um, evolutionary anthropology, right? Uh, and so we have to think about what I have to think about when and when I do not want to play this music because it is embedded in this intellectual tradition. Um, this is an example from the liner notes. And again, this was um, this was put out by Folkways as uh, I suppose as a testament to this earlier tradition of collection. And what happens when it moves from the, the Berlin Phonogram Archive to, um, to Folkways is something really interesting. But this is from Hornbostel's original, um, uh, original writing. And I had originally wanted to choose something that was from Canada, choose something that was Cree. There are two Cree songs that were um, collected, as well as songs that are collected by Franz Boas in British Columbia. And I had wanted to put, put this forward because it's kind of interesting to have a song that's collected, goes to Berlin, goes to New York, and then have it played back here in Canada. But this is what Hornbostel, von Hornbostel has to say. He says, I have managed to acquire some 20 cylinders containing around 40 songs for our collection. Some of these are the type which are usually considered to be secret songs and are therefore very difficult to obtain. Um, this did not stop him. He, um, he obtained them anyway. And as a result, I am loath to, um, to play something like this for you uh, because of the ethics which were not in place when people were collecting um, during that time period, right? Um, and yet I wanted to play something from this and I chose something from West Sumatra. So I'm playing it for you. The reason that I'm playing it is because I know something, I'm a, I'm a scholar of Sumatra of this particular area. Um, it is sometimes used in ritual music. It was recorded in a colonial fort, Fort de Kock, a Dutch, a Dutch fort um, by a Malay player. Um, and yet I know enough about this to think that uh, it's, it's okay for me to play it for you today. 
Um, I want, I'll make a couple of observations and then I'll close with some larger um, ideas uh, about what happens when you move this into the Smithsonian folk, uh, into, this, into the Folkways collection. So let's play this for you briefly. Um, let's see here. I need to share and I will share to this one. Okay. All right, so this is, um, an example of a piece for a shalm or a, a piece for a pupuit. Um, and actually I'd better um, show you what that looks like. So let's just really get really briefly back to my, um, my PowerPoint. This is what this instrument that you're about to hear is. And the reason I picked it is because it's the most unassuming instrument. It's created and then it is not used um, for, you know, it will last maybe for a couple of weeks, maybe a month. It's made out of uh, bamboo. It's an oboe. Um, and in this part of the world, what's interesting is that double reeds from Western Asia moving through Islamic networks into Southeast Asia are very important and very prestigious. But this is an indigenous Sumatran way of understanding the world through sound. And what I love about it is that you can simultaneously hear the difficulty of recording. You're going to hear something that sounds like a um, percussion instrument, but it's actually a warped wax cylinder that has kind of a thunk to it when it goes around. Um, uh, but you're also going to hear even through the less the sound of this instrument. And what I love about it is how it moves from sounds that are discernible to us, like um, a double reed, to sounds that sound like a voice, which is an, an intentional, to sounds that sounds like just reveling in sound for sound's sake. So let me go ahead and play that for you. Um, and then uh, I'll just do some quick concluding thoughts as I know that we are um, quite, uh, we, well, you're bearing with us, aren't you? If you weren't, you wouldn't be here. So here's this song. <laughs> So what I love about that is that when it sounds like a double read, you're thinking that that's what you're hearing. And then all of a sudden you're hearing some voice in a language that you can't even imagine. And it's because it's the voice of bamboo and palm fronds when they're put together. I particularly uh, just was entranced by the sound of it, um, even though it, uh, it, is so, it is so unassuming. This is just the least prestigious of all instruments. And yet here it is for you. So um, the interesting thing about the horn Bostel collection was that it was taken from the uh, collection of none other than Henry Cowell, the ultra modernist composer that Scott Smallwood was just talking about, who captivated him in the fourth grade. And he was a professor at um, the new school at Hornbostel went to the new school very briefly. And so um, uh, what's interesting to me is that even, uh, even if it was originally uh, meant as a demonstration of number one, curiosity of world musical sounds, there's absolutely no question about that. But even if it was originally situated in a hierarchical um, position to other musics, um, which is something that, um, 
you know, New York City, Columbia University particularly um, was instrumental in dismantling, um, even if that was originally the case, by publishing it with Folkways Records alongside the sounds of the junkyard, the sounds of Puerto Ricans, the sounds of Woody Guthrie and Lead Belly, it allows it to take its place within this incredible kind of landscape of music, egalitarian music um, that is enabled by this incredible access. Um, so I think that it is redeemed in many ways by being um, in position and in um, uh, parody with so many of these other musical traditions uh, worldwide. I just want to finish with this last thing, which kind of took me by surprise. So. Um, it's not a musical example. It's an excerpt from the liner notes from Henry Cowell. And now Henry Cowell, as I mentioned, is an ultra-modernist composer who did things like go into the strings of a piano. Um, but he also was a, an ethnomusi uh, ethnomusicology student. He was the favorite student of Charles Seeger, who is the father or was the father of Pete Seeger. And so there's all of this interesting connection. Um, actually, uh, Henry Cowell often wrote many of the liner notes for the um, Folkways World Music Series, Ethnic Folkways Library, um, together with a man named uh, Harold uh, Corlander. Um, and uh, he, uh, he was responsible responsible for the music of Indonesia um, 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 album, which again is my area of study. So I was looking at the liner notes. And as I was looking at the liner notes, I became really surprised because as I've been teaching about gamelan, I always had this little, this thing that I used to say, but I never remembered exactly where I got it from. So just indulge me for 30 seconds. Indonesian gamelan music is one of the most well-known world music ensembles. It, is, it involves bronze percussion and gong instruments. And the most difficult thing to record is the gong because it's a resonating instrument. You can feel it when you're in the place. It's low and its frequencies are undeniable, but actually when you record it, it's probably the softest instrument. And so what I had always been telling students to explain to them the importance of the gamelan ensemble as a ritual, an element of physical manifestation of, um, of spirituality that you cannot step over, was that when the gong stops, that doesn't mean that the music stops. There's these ideas of gong cycles that you play when you're going through gamelan, and when you stop playing, it doesn't mean that the music stops, it means that you've stopped tapping into it. But I never remembered exactly where I came up with this idea. I studied with Judith Becker, who is a well-known ethnomusicologist. It wasn't in any of my notes. I couldn't remember exactly who said it. And then I read this, this from Folkways, um, the Folkways Indonesia uh, album. Here it is, the second, uh, the second, uh, here we go. In the quasi-mythological theory of music, music goes on all the time about us, but is inaudible unless brought into reality by Gamelan by folkways. The time sequence is controlled by musical priests who calculate where the continuous music has arrived at any given moment. The great cycle is seven years long and once in every seven years, the end of the old cycle and the beginning of the new is marked by the sounding of the great gong said to be the world's largest in the Sultan's temple. The tone lasts for slightly over an hour and when it is to be sounded, pilgrims from all over the East come to hear it. Once started, the music runs continuously, though inaudibly for the next seven years, and some of the main smaller cycles are marked by the sounding of other large gongs in various temples. When a gamelan actually plays, it is thought that it merely makes audible that which is already going on in the musical cosmos. So what I love about that, as you can probably tell, is number one, I know where I got it from. That's very helpful. Now I can use it with without, uh, without thinking uh, twice. Um, I, can, I can cite Henry Cowell. But it seems like that's what Folkways does, right? It is a manifestation of, from time to time making audible that which is going on all around us. And if Javanese gamelan music is seen as being something that is specifically played for auspicious times, times when cycles connect birthdays, um, all kinds of ritual elements. It makes particular sense that we are using this cycle, I think the 115th anniversary of Michael Ash's birthday, to talk about um, uh, folkways uh, through this elaborate metaphor and to congratulate him and everybody related to him on both his birthday and the ways that he helped to manifest um, this world sound for our ears. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Julia. That was fantastic. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone for sticking around and letting us go a little bit over tonight. Um, it's just been so fun. Um, what I want to do now is, um, first of all, I know some of you need to leave, and um, those, so this is technically the end. I want to make one quick um, important announcement, and then you know, we'll hang out for a few minutes um, just in case there are some folks who want to say something or have some questions. And I also just want to say um, hello to both Michael and Jessica Ash, who are in the audience tonight. Uh, so happy to see you here. Well, there's here's me in the shadows. <laughs> um, and Hi there. there's Margaret with me in the Hi, shadows. In the shadows, too. In the shadows too. Um, of course, we just we just loved this presentation. My goodness, it was uh, breathtaking and very, very, very enriching for us. So thank you both for doing that. Um, and of course, uh, it goes without saying, I saw Regula's name um, as one of the people who is hopefully listening and watching this. And, um, all my shout outs to her and kudos to her for all the work. There she is. Yes. All the work she did over all this time. Re Regula. Um, oh, you, there, this is. This. Yeah, there. I'm here too. There you are. This is but, wonderful. <laughs> you kept the faith, you kept it going, even when there was nothing at uh, U of A after the collection arrived you always kept the faith you had those beautiful events every fall um it's just so wonderful to see that that what what you what you held on to and pushed for uh coming to such a wonderful place with these wonderful people in charge now i i'm so excited but Regula, uh, you, you always kept the faith. We're, uh, we're so grateful. I'll, I'll just add um, one um, kind of levity moment uh, following from Julia's uh, talk. So I don't know when that Van Horn Bustle album actually came into the Folkways collection. Um, but I worked there from 66 to 68 or so, somewhere in there. And I don't remember it. So maybe it was there, maybe it wasn't. It says Institute of Ethnomusicology, Indiana University. Right. So that they have something to do with it. Yeah, for sure. But I took an ethnomusicology course with, um, with Willard Rhodes. Um, and um, he gave us this book by Court Socks called The Wellsprings of Music. And I know this is inside baseball, but I just have to tell you this. Um, and it was this evolutionary thing. And he said, three note music preceded four note music and all this kind of garbage. And there I am in the anthropology department at Columbia, which is, as you say, <laughs> it's exactly the opposite. And there's one album on folkways that I actually insisted goes on folkways because it it absolutely tore his argument apart and it's the songs of the lyre bird huh. because the lyre bird of course copies everything and if the lyre bird can do mozart why can't human beings do anything <laughs> <laughs> oh that's amazing Regula, I was going to put in a Music of India example um, so that I could specifically reference you. Um, but then I, I suppose I chickened out in the end. <laughs> yeah, I had a Sarangi and Tabla Tarang piece I was going to play. But then I realized I really don't know what I'm talking about. So I better just leave it to the expert. <laughs> oh, this is great. Those who are watching the chat um, will note um, some lovely messages from others, including Grant Stovall. Um, and I also see um, uh, Joan Greer, a previous director of Sound Studies here. Uh, I see Dana Wiley and obviously Regula, one of our first shepherds of all this, this wonderful collection. So it's just great to see everybody here. Um, Tom also just put a link to that Lyrebird recording um, in the chat as well. So um, 
uh, take advantage of that while you can <laughs> before we close up. Okay, well, everyone, this has just been wonderful. Um, thanks, thanks so much for um, for staying and. Um, and we will also be posting very soon and sending to our mailing list and other places the um, lecture, the list of lectures for next term. We have a whole really great lineup of things happening. I think the first one is Stephanie Loveless, sound artist, will be talking about her work. And again, we will have um, some kind of uh, Women of Folkways event, actually two of them, and a workshop and a, and a lecture, and we'll let you know about those as well. So thanks again to everyone for coming, and um, have a wonderful evening.